Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning to those of you watching us from different time zones. Uh, my name is Ana Cristina Santos, and together with my colleague Bruno Sena Martins, uh, we are directors of the PhD program Human Rights in Contemporary Societies here at the Center for Social Studies, uh, University of Coimbra. Uh, the event that you are now attending is part of the Human Rights Online Seminar Series 2021. Uh, this is the sixth event of this series. So as I was saying before, I present our distinguished guest speaker of uh, today's event, just to give you um, a few notes on the, on the program. So as I was saying, this is part of um, an organization from the PhD program, Human Rights in Contemporary Societies. Uh, we have been um, working in this program since the beginning, and we started in 2013. So this is already the fifth edition. And indeed, I see here uh, in the audience many of the names and faces from, from different editions. Um, I hope everyone feels welcome. Even our former students who are now uh, doctors uh, and our colleagues. So this PhD program is very, very interdisciplinary. Uh, we proudly take a very critical approach to human rights, dealing with a variety of topics, and we expect our students to be uh, very politically engaged uh, in issues that are relevant uh, to the present days. And so the topic of today's session couldn't be more timely, more engaging, more politically relevant, as well as theoretically relevant. So without uh, any more delays, I'm uh, uh, very thrilled to, to present our, our speaker uh, today, uh, Ro Rao. He's currently fellow uh, at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences and lecturer in international political thought at the University of St. Andrews. He's the author of many, many relevant publications, including the books Out of Time, The Queer Politics of Postcoloniality and Third World Protest Between Home and the World. Both of these books have been published by the Oxford University Press. He's currently writing a new book. So this is very good news for those of us who follow Ro Rao's work. And this book will be precisely on the politics of controversial status. So this is exactly the topic uh, Ro Rao is bringing to us this afternoon. And uh, Raul, I want to thank you sincerely for having accepted to be with us. And we're looking forward to hear you. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christina. Thanks for the um, invitation and the introduction. Um, and thanks to Bruno and Anna also for your part in organizing the event. Um, and thanks to the audience for coming. Um, I'm going to be using some slides. So um, as Christina said, I'm, I'm writing a book about the politics of statues and particularly why statues seem to have become a terrain for the contestation and the assertion of racial and caste supremacy. Uh, the geography of the project is largely the footprint of the former British Empire. So I'm looking at uh, events unfolding within the UK, but I'm also very interested in what is going on in South Africa, India, Ghana. Uh, and I suppose I'm trying to tell a kind of intertextual story that links these moments of contestation to one another. Um, having said this, of course, I have one eye on what's happening in the United States, which has been an epicenter of many of these statue protests. And I am very interested in what's happening everywhere else. So I imagine many of you in the audience have been following other parts of the world. I'd be very interested to know what's going on in the places that you study, and especially whether you think something different or distinct is, is going on there. One of the pleasures of this project is that everybody I talk to knows some context, some situation that they want to talk about and know much more about than I do. So I'm very interested to hear what you might bring uh, to the conversation as well. Also, the other thing to say is this is very early stages of the project, which makes giving talks like this particularly useful for me for selfish reasons, because I get to kind of absorb um, ideas and questions and things that you uh, think are important. So 
Even if it will take time to decide what to do with them, the era of colonial statues may be over. This is a very grand statement and I may live to regret it. But what I think I'm trying to suggest is that we may perhaps have reached some kind of tipping point in terms of the acceptability of these kinds of artifacts in public space. Um, for many, that tipping point became evident perhaps after the murder of George Floyd uh, and the Black Lives Matter protest that followed that. Uh, in many of these protests, statues of figures associated with colonialism and slavery, which seemed to saturate the built environments of the Western world, provided targets for anger. Um, this is just one of them. In the US, particularly, protesters attacked statues of Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, and other soldiers and politicians from the Confederate States. In the UK, after years of agitation and negotiation over the statue that honored the slave trader Edward Colston as, and I quote, a virtuous and wise son of Bristol, BLM protesters took matters into their own hands, as you can see on this slide. To the cheers of a crowd of several hundreds, they tore down the statue and threw it into the harbor. In Oxford, Oriel College finally accepted a core demand of the Roads Must Fall movement by agreeing to take down the statue of the arch imperialist Cecil Rhodes, which adorns the facade of the college on the high street. This has not yet happened because despite the college promising to take down the statue, this has now become mired in um, all sorts of controversies over heritage preservation, but also concerns that donors will withdraw bequests to the college. Um, so this is still a situation in which Rhodes is protected by money and um, connections in high places. And many, many other statues in London and in the UK more generally have become targets. So in London, statues of Robert Milligan, Thomas Guy, Robert Clayton, Elsewhere, Henry Dundas and David Hume in Edinburgh, Francis Drake in Plymouth, Thomas Picton in Cardiff, Robert Clive in Shrewsbury, Horatio Nelson in Trafalgar Square, and William Gladstone in many, many places. He's Prime Minister of the UK, so um, he's very heavily memorialized. There's also been anger from right-wing, I would call them white supremacists who have been angered by the targeting of British icons and especially by the graffiti scrawled by BLM protesters on the statue of Churchill. So one of the protesters scribbled was a racist on the statue of Churchill. And so far right groups have gathered in London to defend statues and memorials, which local authorities have then preemptively boarded up. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has set up what is called a Commission for Diversity in the Public Realm, which has been tasked with reviewing the whole city's statues, memorials, street names, public art, and murals to ensure that its diversity is appropriately recognized and celebrated. But in, interestingly, their mandate is not to take down anything, as far as I understand, it's to add to the existing landscape of the city. And of course, things have been happening in many, many other places, Belgium, New Zealand, um, as well as some of the places I'm about to talk about. So, as I said, the central question for me is why have statues become a terrain for this discussion, this very long running discussion about race and the legacies of slavery, colonialism and apartheid. In other words, what is in a statue? So one of the paradoxes of arguments about statues is that despite the considerable heat that they generate, the statues themselves tend to be regarded as ephemeral, as superficial, as at best a device through which to provoke conversation about supposedly more important things. So when the Roads Must Fall protests erupted in the UK, even commentators who were sympathetic to its demands seemed to suggest that the material issues behind these demands were more important than the statue. And those material demands were things like decolonization of the curriculum, recruitment of more black staff and students, um, and um, provision of uh, more mental health support and all of these kinds of issues. The statue itself was treated as merely an entry point into the discussion of these supposedly more important issues. I want to suggest that this is both sensible because of course the material issues are what is at stake here and what is what is what we want change on. 
But I want to suggest that if we just write off statues as a distraction from the more significant material issues or as simply an entry point into those issues, then we're not really answering questions about why statues are built and why we seem to invest them with the sorts of emotions and psychic feelings that we currently project onto them in the way that we do. What is additionally very interesting is that many of the statues that were brought down recently through popular direct action were subject to a variety of symbolic punishments, including strangulation, beheading, burning, and drowning. So for example, protesters noted with satisfaction that in being thrown into the waters of Bristol Harbor, the statue of Colston was being made to suffer the fate of thousands of the Africans that he had enslaved who did not survive the Middle Passage. On the 19th of June 2020, which is the holiday that marks the belated arrival of the Emancipation Proclamation in the state of Texas, it had to travel all the way from the East Coast to Texas, and it took, I think, about two years to do that. So this is the holiday that marks the arrival of the Emancipation Proclamation in Texas. Two statues of Confederate soldiers were torn down at the state capitol at Raleigh, North Carolina. One was hung from a lamppost while the other was dragged down a street and placed in front of a courthouse. Now, you don't need me to tell you that when you see an image like this of a Confederate soldier strung up from a lamppost, it's evoking the specter of lynching, right? It's reminding us of the phenomenon of lynching. It's doing to these white uh, figures of white supremacy what they have done to black people. So I think these, these kinds of symbolic punishments are significant because when we dismiss arguments about statues as simply a means to an end, a more important material end, we can't make sense of the passion and the vitriol and the violence that both defenders and opponents of statues bring to bear on these objects through these practices of veneration, commemoration, maintenance, vandalism, this is a very ideologically loaded word, vandalism, defacement, mockery, right? Whatever we choose to call it, it's obvious that there is a lot of feeling circulating in these moments. We fail to take iconography seriously as a potential site of identity, injury, and repair. And I would say what we fail to take seriously, the psychic lives of statues, which I'm trying to use as a kind of working title for, for the book that I'm writing. So why statues? In, this is a big question and I'm only making a beginning in answering it, but I think it's the very publicness of statues that makes them available for these kinds of psychosocial investments. Um, we often describe statues as phallic objects. And I think we do this for reasons that go beyond the obvious fact that most of them in public space represent men and also the shape of the statue is often seen as a kind of phallic object. Typically built to endure, a statue is a bid for immortality. It's a way of a figure becoming immortal. And it's placed in the center of the Agora. The statue demands attention. Unlike virtually every other medium of visual representation, so think of a book or a film or a play or a painting, all of these things require us as readers and viewers to approach the medium. The statue is different. The statue does not require our consent to thrust itself upon us. It's just there. We see it without giving it permission for it to show itself to us. At the same time, like the phallus, statues are vulnerable because they stand alone and unguarded and exposed in the public square. So they have this peculiar quality where they are simultaneously aggressive because they have not sought our consent and they're also insecure. And this I think lends them lends themselves to becoming lightning rods for public discontent. It also makes them available for angry popular reinscription and challenge in a way that other terrains of history are not. So we can change history by writing a work of revisionist history. We can also change history by scribbling graffiti on a wall. In that sense, statues provide a more democratic, a more demotic terrain for this kind of challenging of history that I think movements on the street are interested in doing. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should simply forget about the material stakes and focus on the cultural and the symbolic, because I also want to, to remind us that not all statues are controversial. 
we're surrounded by statues of unsavory historical figures, but only a small minority of them leap into significance. And that happens only when somebody is able to tell a persuasive story, connecting them to some pressing contemporary material concern, whether that's an instance of violence or the institutional racism of police or healthcare or universities or something else. So rather than simply inverting the material cultural relationship to say the cultural is more important than the material, what I'm trying to get us to do is to attend to the traffic, the two way movement between the material and the cultural. And one way to do that, I think, is to be attentive to the question of time. Why does a statue become controversial at a particular time? So when we talk about the time of a statue, I wanna suggest that statues live in at least four times. So there's first the time of the events and the historical figures that they represent. Secondly, the time in which they are built. Thirdly, the time in which they are viewed. And fourthly, the futures that we project onto statues. And maybe there are more times as well that we can think of, but these are the four that seem to me to be quite significant in many of these controversies. And by attending to the disjunctures between these different moments in time, perhaps we can answer the question, why, when, and for whom does a statue become controversial? So this first occurred to me when I was reading about the Confederate statue protests in the United States. And in particular, a report prepared by the Southern Poverty Law Center in 2016, which undertook this enormous census of Confederate monuments in the United States. It identified 1,503 public spaces that bear Confederate place names and symbols. Uh, that number has probably gone up because this is an ongoing project and the database is constantly updated. Now, most of these memorials, as you probably know, commemorate the US Civil War that took place between 1861 and 65. But the interesting thing about them is that they were not built at that time because the Southern states in the US were far too poor, having been defeated in the Civil War, to spend enormous sums of money building these statues. So most of the statues were built in two waves, 50 years later and 100 years later. First in 1910, 20, around that time, and then in the 1950s and 60s. And what is really significant about both those periods is that these were periods of white pushback against black advancement. In the early decades of the 20th century, 20th century, you had the Jim Crow laws segregating the US South. In the 1950s and 60s, you had the famous US Supreme Court decision desegregating public schooling, and you had a massive pushback from white supremacist groups like the Ku Klux Klan organizing to, um, to uh, kind of stave off these sorts of advances. One of the writers who helps us explain what role the statues plays is none other than W.E.B. Du Bois, who in Black Reconstruction makes a very important argument. The question he asks in, a, in a, one of the chapters is, why is there not a class alliance between poor whites and poor blacks? And the answer he gives is that this is because poor whites have been peeled away from potential class allies by being given the sort of public psychic, but not material boost through Jim Crow laws, through the construction of these statues of white heroes they have been sutured to the rich white planter class. They have been attached to the rich white planter class and made to feel like part of that class, even though in terms of material benefits, they are of course very different. So this psychic, what he calls the public and psychological boost and what uh, writers like David Rodiger have called the wages of whiteness is what binds poor whites to rich whites and prevents the formation of a class alliance between poor whites and poor blacks. Now, in some ways, I think controversies over Confederate statues are an easy analytical case for our moral intuitions, not easy politically, very difficult to discharge, dis dislodge politically, but relatively simple for us to make sense of as critical race theorists, because the meaning of the statue has stayed the same across all of these different moments. It has always been a symbol of white supremacy for white supremacists. It has always been a symbol of oppression for uh, black and formerly enslaved people. So a more difficult case, I think, are those in which the meaning of the statue shifts over time or between these different temporal moments. 
And here I want to point to the example of Gandhi, who is also extremely controversial, particularly now in the wake of protests from Dalit activists, um, subordinate caste groups in the Indian context, as well as Black Lives Matter protesters in the United States, in South Africa and elsewhere. So a good example of this is June 2016, when the Indian president at the time gifted a statue of Gandhi to the University of Ghana. It was installed on the university campus in Accra. Almost immediately, angry articles appeared in the local press denouncing the statue and demanding its removal. The protesters made three arguments against the statue. First, they said Gandhi was a racist because as an activist in South Africa, he had campaigned to renegotiate the position of Indians in the racial hierarchy, rather than attacking that racial hierarchy per se. And he was also known to refer to Black Africans using very um, derogatory language um, as barbarians, as uncivilized, uh, suggesting that Indians occupied a superior civilizational position and ought to be treated better than the Africans. The second argument they made was Gandhi was casteist. And to demonstrate this, they point to his very well-known arguments with the leading Dalit uh, thinker and visionary of his time, B.R. Ambedkar, who's also the architect of India's constitution. These two leading figures of the Indian independence movement had fierce disagreements over the question of caste. Gandhi, in a 1936 essay, offered a highly idealized and Ambedkar argued a very disingenuous account of the caste system, arguing that whatever its abuses in practice, in theory, all castes are equal in the eyes of God. Ambedkar said, of course, it's very convenient to say all castes are equal in the eyes of God. The fact is that they are not treated equally in the eyes of human beings, and that is what matters. But the third argument that the Ghanaian protest has made was that it had nothing to do with Gandhi. It had much more to do with India and the shifting place of India in the African imaginary. The protesters said there are no statues of African heroes and heroines on our campus who can serve as examples of who we are and what we have achieved as a people. And they suggested that it would be better to stand up for our dignity than to kowtow to the wishes of a burgeoning Eurasian superpower. So this last comment suggests that whatever India might once have meant to Ghanaians as a leading post-colonial state speaking truth to global power, perceptions of India have changed quite radically as a result of the ways in which India's power has grown geopolitically, India impinges on the African continent, its hunger for land and resources. It increasingly registers in the consciousness of an African public as a racist entity. And this is in part because of the attacks on African students and African um, expatriates working in Indian cities. There was a spate of these attacks around this time. In the very month that the Gandhi statue was unveiled in Ghana, a Congolese man was murdered in New Delhi, prompting the African heads of mission to threaten to boycott the Africa Day celebrations, which were being organized in New Delhi at the time. And at least one of the Ghanaian protesters very sensibly says, rather than building statues, it might be better to take action against the racism that Africans experience in India. This might be a more effective way of deepening relations between the two states. So in this last instance, we see that Gandhi's reputation has changed, has suffered in the eyes of a broader public, not just because of who he was and what he did in his lifetime, but also because of the shifting place of India in the global imaginary, particularly in the global south and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So when we talk about decolonization and particularly decolonization of the public space, it is not a simple thing to, to decide who counts as a decolonial figure. We cannot decolonize public space in London, for example, simply by building statues of Gandhi, which is something that uh, people have assumed uh, is a way to shift urban space and public space. Um, this particular statue of Gandhi was installed in Westminster Square outside the parliament in London. And it's particularly ironic because the announcement about the statue came in the same week that ministers serving in David Cameron's uh, cabinet were lobbying the Indian government to purchase British arms, right? So the, think of the irony of this. You build a statue to the apostle of peace at the same moment that you're lobbying for an arms deal. 
Um, it, it shows again how the meaning of Gandhi has shifted from being an apostle of peace to being a symbol of the geopolitical might of India. And so this I'm suggesting is a way of thinking about how the meaning of a symbol shifts in different moments in time and is not static. And yet building new statues does offer a powerful and visible emblem of decolonization. Nowhere has this been pursued with more zeal than in India, where the Dalit movement has built tens of thousands of statues of its foremost leader, Ambedkar. In 1997 alone, when the Dalit Bahujan Samaj party, this is a party of uh, uh, representing mostly Dalits, was in power in the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, it built 15,000 statues of Ambedkar. And these statues are built on a wide variety of scales. So this picture is one of the grandest of the Ambedkar statues, but many of them are uh, on a much smaller scale in villages and are often put up at the expense of the local Dalit community. These statues do very important material and symbolic work. In a material sense, they claim space in a socio-political context in which exclusion from public space was one of the central tools through which Dalits were humiliated by caste Hindus. They're also a powerful symbol of Dalit dignity and pride because they celebrate a community icon while also forcefully reminding a broader Indian public of the debt that we all owe Ambedkar as the chairperson of the drafting committee of the Indian constitution. But Ambedkar statues have also provoked antagonism and they frequently become targets of vandalism by caste Hindus. Some local authorities, this is a sort of parallel image to the authorities in London boarding up the statue of Churchill. They're afraid of being unable to protect the statue from attacks. So they preemptively board it up or put it in a cage, um, ostensibly for the statue's protection. But you can also read that cage as a, as a way of um, entrapping. Uh, reducing the power of the symbol, placing him quite literally behind bars. In a different uh, register, a crit one of the other criticisms that has been made is the expense of building all these statues. So Mayavati, the Dalit chief minister, former Dalit chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, is believed to have allocated somewhere between 500 million and 1.3 billion US dollars for the construction of statues and memorials. It's an enormous figure, particularly in a poor country. But these kinds of high-minded criticisms have not impeded rival statue building projects by upper caste Hindus, particularly in the BJP. So this is an image of the tallest statue in the world, which is double the height of the Statue of Liberty. And it now stands in the West Indian state of Gujarat, which is a bastion of the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party. Um, it, this was built at a cost of about, I believe, $430 million. It reaches a height of 240 meters, currently the tallest statue in the world. And it's a statue of Sardar Vallabhai Patel, who is the first home minister of the uh, first independent government of India. He's often referred to as the Iron Man of India because as home minister, it was his role to craft, to create the Indian Union. Um, the country that we call India today was divided into British Indian provinces and a host of hundreds of nominally independent kingdoms which at the time of independence were given a theoretical choice to join India, to join Pakistan, or to remain independent. But Vallabhai Patel, using all of the tools and levers and uh, instruments of coercion at his, at his, um, you know, at his uh, available to him, persuaded most of these states to join India. So he is very much identified as the figure responsible for the unity of India. And so this statue is now called the Statue of Unity. Interestingly, he is not a member of the BJP. He's a member of the Congress. The BJP didn't exist at the time. And in fact, the Hindu right played very little role in the Indian anti-British Indian independence movement. So they have very few icons from this time. And so this is also an attempt to, to rest, to peel away some of the more right-wing Congress figures to give the BJP a genealogy of its own. So this is part of the politics of memory and a struggle over memory that's going on here. But there's more to this particular site because the statue is built on the site of the Sardar Sarovar Dam. This is a massive hydroelectric project also named after this man, which displaced a quarter of a million, mainly Adivasi or indigenous people um, several decades ago. 
Arundhati Roy wrote one of her most famous essays, The Greater Common Good, as a kind of protest against what this dam was doing to, to people and the mode of development that it represented. It's situated amidst an extensively redeveloped landscape. There are hotels and amusement parks and water parks and zoos and all kinds of things. You can't quite tell from the picture I've posted because this is one of the early images. But if you look at pictures now, um, the whole area is much more lush. And this is not the end because work is underway to build an even taller statue of yet another Hindu right-wing icon, Shivaji, the Maratha warrior king, Shivaji off the coast of Bombay. And this apparently will cost $540 million. So the game goes on and on. In the face of these retaliatory cycles of violence and expenditure, it may be tempting to call for a moratorium on statue building, right? To say no more statues. And this is in fact what one of India's, I would call him a centrist public intellectual, Ram Guha has, has said. But I think there's something a little bit too glib about this position because it posits a false moral equivalence between the claims of very different groups. In short, I want to suggest that Dalit statue building is not the same thing as Hindu right statue building, and we cannot equate these two projects. We need to ask questions, I think, about who needs statues and who does not, whose pain matters and whose pain does not, uh, to put it quite bluntly. Um, to posit a moral equivalence between these things is to overlook the ways in which the contemporary public sphere is a deeply unequal space that is hostile to the participation of certain social groups. It refuses to see how mobilizations around statues, both for their construction and destruction, are often attempts to force entry into the public sphere through the formation of what political theorist Nancy Fraser calls subaltern counter publics. We can have a conversation maybe about how a statue can create a subaltern counter public. Now, insofar as statue mobilizations are about creating subaltern counter publics, we need to distinguish between claims that seek a, a toehold in a public sphere out of which their proponents have been shut out and those that are driven by a desire to ratify a stranglehold over a public sphere into which no one else is let in. A slightly cumbersome statement, but a, an, a, an easier way to put this is that we need to distinguish between iconoclasms from above and iconoclasms from below. If we do not do this, then we end up, and this is often done in the popular, especially right-wing media, you see these facile equations of, isn't roads must fall like the Taliban? And my answer is it's not, because in one case, we're looking at an iconoclasm from below. In another case, we're looking at an iconoclasm of those who are in charge of a country. Um, and we need to think of those phenomena very differently. So um, I don't want to go on for much longer, but maybe what I'll do in this final section of the talk is to just think about how activists and theorists and academics, but also sculptors and artists are thinking imaginatively about the what is to be done question, which is a very big question and I cannot answer it in any simple fashion. If statues and buildings express a will to power, then contention over them entails nothing less than a redistribution of power in society. In some ways, displacing these power struggles onto the terrain of the built environment it can offer a safer, maybe less violent way of renegotiating power. Better to argue about statues than to argue about live bodies, right? If this is true, then we should welcome rather than run away from such arguments and use them as opportunities for mean, meaningful reckonings with the past and its legacies in the present. But of course, this is easier to say than to do. So what are the options? Almost nobody in the liberal commentariat advocates the outright destruction of statues. But one of the arguments I want to make is that that might sometimes be the best thing to do. It's not the only argument I'm making, but it's one of the, I want to make space for destruction as a potential alternative. And I know this is not popular and people often react very um, worriedly to that suggestion. But I want to, turn us back to those images of joy and exuberance that greeted all of these instances of statue beheading and burning and hanging and drowning. And I want to ask, and I'm just asking the question, I don't yet have much more to say about it, but can there be some reparative potential in acts of collective and creative destruction? 
Why should we presume that modern societies have somehow rid themselves of the need for symbolic acts of purging and expiation when we accept that ancient societies did this all the time? The solution that most people suggest is something that is variously called contextualization or adding of context. I think this too can be very good, but it doesn't always work because contextualization is often constrained by considerations of aesthetics and sighting. Think of many of these statues very grand, built on a very grand scale, high up on a pedestal or a plinth. And ask yourself, how much is a small piece of text on the base of that plinth going to do to interrupt the aesthetic power of the statue? In, in other words, these statues are operating at multiple levels, right? There's a, there's a sort of analytical level where it's providing information about the figure and the time. But there's also an aesthetic force, which is very difficult to disrupt through some other medium like text particularly text that is small, that requires reading, that requires a different kind of engagement. So yes, contextualization can work and it's often very effective, but sometimes it doesn't do much to, to, to evacuate the aesthetic power of the statue. And if you think back to the ways in which, for example, white supremacists relate to these statues, think of that famous Unite the Right rally that was held in um, Charlottesville in Virginia when Trump was, was the president, all of these neo-Nazi groups gathering around the statue almost reverentially. What can one do to a statue like that? What does the addition of a textual plaque do to evacuate that kind of artifact of its pulling power, right? So yes to contextualization, but it doesn't always work. Some artists have done very imaginative things. So the artist Hugh Locke says, what we are talking about here is redress, right? redress of grievance. And so he does it quite literally by redressing the statue. Um, in a series entitled Natives and Colonials, the British artist Hugh Locke indulges in what he calls mindful vandalism by painting on photographs of statues. I think his original intention was to paint on the statues themselves, but that was not realized for various reasons. So in doing this, Locke desacralizes the statues. He strips them of the connotations of purity associated with white marble and reminds us also that they might have originally looked quite different. In a more interventionary series called Patriots, he dresses statues of figures such as Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and Christopher Columbus by attaching chains, beads, medals, coins, cowries, talismans, ribbons, and other objects to photographs of the statues. These objects remind us of what these figures were doing in their time with their wealth and power. And in that sense, this is, I think, quite an interestingly subversive intervention. If representation is what is at stake in controversies over statues, how can we do justice to those who find themselves unrepresented in public space? Who or what will fill the empty plinths vacated by our current statues? Who will decide and how? And if, as seems to be increasingly apparent, we live in an era of fallism, I'm using the term that South African activists use, right? Roads must fall, fees must fall, everything must fall. We live in an era of fallism when every icon must sooner or later fall from grace, how can we be confident that the decisions we make today about iconography will endure tomorrow? We can't, right? They're going to be provisional and temporary and they're going to be challenged and contested. In a series called Redefining the Power, the Angolan artist Kiluanji Kiahenda photographs ordinary people standing on the vacated plinths of Angola's colonial and Marxist monuments. Henda sees the monuments as clandestine citizens with expired visas. I think this is very interesting because this is a reversal of the ways in which immigrants in the metropolis are positioned. Henda sees the monuments as clandestine citizens with expired visas who have outlived their welcome and should perhaps be deported to their places of origin after paying a fine for illegal permanence. He's clearly referring both to the, the situation of migrants and what is done to migrants, but he's also referring to the debates and controversies over museum artifacts in the colonial West and the demand for repatriation. And in effect, he's saying, you give us that back and we will give you these back in a kind of exchange of, of artifacts and property. He suggests they might be exchanged for objects of stolen African art currently displayed in Western museums. 
In the meanwhile, he reclaims them by having his friends climb up on their pedestals to enliven and infuse them with their own passions and preoccupations. So this is part of a series in which we see um, Angolan citizens today climbing up on the pedestals and reclaiming them, and he has them photographed. And many of them are dressed uh, very elaborately in, for example, bridal dress or everyday clothes or, or whatever. But finally, there are some things that statues cannot do. How do we represent the unrepresentable, the exterminated, the disappeared, the enslaved, the subaltern, the ones who leave no trace? Sometimes it may be necessary to give up the fiction of faithful figural representation. Can we find adequate forms of recognition that do not rely on embodied representation, the body itself? When we think of statues and sculpture, we're mostly, almost always, except in the case of abstract sculpture, we're thinking of the body. So what do we do in those situations where a body is unrepresentable? In, this, in these situations, we seem to reach some kind of limit, not just a limit of language, but a limit of signification itself. There have been exemplary attempts to grapple with this. Um, the Holocaust memorials, for example, tend not to use figural representation. Uh, in Amsterdam, where I am now, but also in Berlin and other parts of uh, Europe, um, that were occupied by the Nazis and where Jews were sent to deportation camps. One can see in the pavements brass plaques commemorating people who were uh, deported to the camps and killed. Um, I also think here of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, which through this display, I think evokes the specter of lynching. This is popularly called the lynching museum. Again, it's not quite figural representation. And I think also of the Parque de la Memoria in Buenos Aires, which uh, has a very uncanny, interesting way of telling the story of the desaparecidos, the disappeared, and um, the, the story of the junta and the aftermath in Argentina. It's a street like this with lampposts, and you think you're walking down just another street, and then you look at the signs on the lampposts, and you realize that they're telling you the history of the country each of these signs represents a different year in, in the recent history of Argentina. I've just got a photograph of some of them here. So where does this end? This is a very interesting question I was asked when I was on a BBC news program um, a few years ago. Um, so in a number of conversations that I've had in the media about statues, I've often been asked where the agitation against statues might end. This line of questioning often takes the form, what about X, what about Y? You know, if you're going to take down X, then surely you have to take down Y. And the question circles ever closer to historical figures at the heart of national identity, as if, you know, what about Churchill, what about Gandhi? As if hoping to discover a limit beyond which the iconoclasts will fear to tread. If such a limit is declared, it is bound to look arbitrary. Uh, I think Sadiq Khan as mayor of London somewhat fell into this trap because even before his commission for diversity in the public realm took off, he appeared to declare when pushed in interviews that he would not contemplate taking down statues of figures of the stature of Churchill, Gandhi, or Malcolm X. So one kind of trap is to draw an arbitrary red line and say, oh, we're not touching these people. We're just going to look at somebody else. But a different kind of trap is to say, no one is beyond reproach. We're going to take down everything, because if you say that, you end up looking like a kind of nihilist, like a sort of ISIS, uh, you know, uh, everything goes kind of iconoclast. But this, I think, is a trap worth falling into, because if arguments about statues of historical figures are actually arguments about the present, then a radical anti-racism should not reassure its critics that the core of national identity will escape unscathed for it is exactly this score that we are trying to challenge. And so one answer to the question, where does it end, is quite simply, it doesn't. Um, and maybe that's where I'll stop today. Thank you.